Watch this. Another Idaho law, another lawsuit filed against it. The abortion trafficking bill getting the legal look over this time with Idaho's attorney general at the center. They called her the traveling lady for a reason. Rosalie Sorrells singing her way coast to coast for decades, but always made it home to Idaho. Now what she collected all those years has found a new home and you can see it for yourself. They call it Mustang Mania, and the challenge is to take a wild horse used to roaming Idaho's rangelands and make it tame enough to ride. Well, we're taking the journey with one Nampa woman and her painted pony. We all know this, abortion is illegal in Idaho, like really illegal. With very few exceptions, the gem state is the most restrictive in the country, we're told. Not only is it illegal here, it's illegal to take a minor to another state where it is legal to get an abortion without her parents' permission. This became the law of the land of this land during this last legislative session. It's the first of its kind, this law, in the country. But it's not so cut and dry. There's the issue of abortion pills and whether or not a county prosecutor will even choose to prosecute, in which case Idaho's Attorney General Raul Labrador could take it to court himself. Being this broad and this vague is why this law and this AG is now facing a lawsuit. Joe Paris spoke with one of the women who filed the suit. Another day, another Idaho law challenged in United States District Court. The topic this time around, abortion trafficking. The law, which went into effect back on May 5th, makes it illegal for an adult to help a minor get an abortion without the permission of the minor's parent or guardian. Specifically, the law prohibits, quote, recruiting, harboring, or transporting the pregnant minor. The law also made it illegal for someone to get abortion pills for a minor. Supporters of the law say it protects Idaho families and children from abortions. Critics have said since the idea was introduced that the law is vague and illegal on several fronts. I work primarily with a young age group, which is 11 to 24. Lourdes Matsumoto is one of the plaintiffs in the case. Matsumoto is an Idaho attorney who regularly works with victims of domestic and sexual violence, including minors. She says the new law prevents her from helping victims get an abortion legally in another state like Oregon. The abortion thing has always been a huge issue, and so all the legislation that comes through does affect my clients and the people that we try to help because it's definitely um, victims of sexual and domestic violence are often find themselves in, in precarious situations when it comes to being pregnant and wanting to know all the options um, that they have. A major issue Matsumoto sees is vague and confusing language that ties her hands from helping people in need. For example, the case says plaintiffs are unable to determine when an in-person meeting with a pregnant person becomes harboring, particularly if that in-person meeting occurs relatively near an Idaho border. It's not clear. Um, it's not exactly clear on what you can and can't do and can and can't say to a minor who comes to you and says, I'm, a, I'm trying to get out of an abusive situation. Here's my situation. Can I even give that person all of their options? I still think it's not legal. House Minority Leader, Democrat Representative Alana Rubel, spoke out during the legislative session saying the law has several glaring issues. She is agreeing with the suit, saying that the abortion travel ban unreasonably burdens the right to enter and leave a state. Just because the Supreme Court said you can ban abortion does not mean they get to throw the First Amendment out the window and the Fifth Amendment out the window and the Fourteenth Amendment out the window. Uh, and this law is so vague. It says that you can't harbor, recruit, or transport a minor um, who's seeking an abortion. Well, I have no idea what recruiting or harboring means. Um, even the sponsor of the bill didn't know. Rubel, Matsumoto, and other advocates highlight a collection of practical constitutional and legal issues they see with the law. Now, they tried to be sneaky on this and say, oh, we're only banning travel inside the state of, tra of Idaho up to the border. Um, but a lot of courts have seen around that and said, clearly, in order to have the constitutional right to interstate travel, it means you need to be, be able to travel inside the state to get to the border. What if, like, a teenager took an Uber or a bus from Boise up to Ontario? Would the driver of that Uber or the driver of that bus even know what they had done? Absolutely. That's 100% um, accurate, and this law doesn't provide for for how to dissect whether or not that that's the case. In fact, it doesn't really provide for anything except for one single affirmative defense. 
I reached out to the Idaho Attorney General's office for comments on this, and of course they can't comment on pending litigation. They say they will be defending this in court. I also do reach out to the bill sponsor, Representative Barbara Ehart. Did not immediately get a response, but if we get one, we will mention that to you. Uh, Brian, though, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. And when talking with legal experts and legal people on this thing today, they told me that one of their concerns that this, this may be a slippery slope. So we know that abortion is illegal in Idaho, legal just over the border in Oregon. Okay, something else that qualifies in that, marijuana. Right. Uh, if you go to the southern border, to Nevada, prostitution is legal there. So there are questions now if this is a slippery slope of could Idaho pass laws that say it's a crime to drive to the border and get marijuana. But this bill specifically deals with minors. Correct. Those other things are obviously illegal for minors anyway. So it, I don't know if it's a quit, you know, black and white issue yeah. there either. It might not be a perfect, uh, I guess, transfer issue there, but there's a lot of attention on this nationally, and we know that this law is being tested in yeah. Idaho. Depending on what happens in here, you could see it uh, pop up in other places. One thing is for certain, there are a lot of laws that this legislature has passed in recent years that are in court, and still in court. That's true. Yep, all right. That's why they have that legislative defense fund. Thank you. Thank you. Well, another new law seems to have created some trouble, just not to that lawsuit level trouble just yet. Idaho's new liquor license law played a key role in shutting down the symposium last month. It's a dog friendly neighborhood bar just off the connector in West Boise. Maybe you've driven by it, maybe you've seen it, maybe you've gone. The owners say they couldn't lease a liquor license anymore, but they say today is the start of a new life because for, well, at least another six months, per Idaho's new liquor laws, a license owner can only sell or transfer their license one time before the state takes it back. And a lease could count as a transfer, which could mean the license owner loses hundreds of thousand dollars by not getting a chance to sell it. For a lease to not count as a transfer, that business must be at that same place, that same location, for one year before that lease begins. And they can't move for a year after it ends. That's how the symposium is getting another six-month chance. Yes, it is correct. How it's going to play out, I don't know. The law just went into effect the beginning of this month. So what it's going to do or how it's going to affect our business in the future, I still don't know. Um, I'd like to, but I don't. And that's why he hires attorneys. The owner, Chris, says his lawyers had to get involved to ensure they can still lease the license. He's going to try to renegotiate a longer lease, longer than six months, but... As he says, he doesn't know. There's no guarantees. All right, speaking of places you might be able to grab a cold beverage, maybe you had to write down today's date. And that's when it hit you. Today is 7-Eleven Day. Big day for Sloopy, Slurpee groupies. Slurpee groupies, that's what I was trying to say. Today's the day you can go to any 7-Eleven and get a free small Slurpee. So kids enjoying the summer heat can rejoice and beat that 90-degree heat with some artificially flavored and colored smashed-up ice all you got to do is take that short drive to Post Falls because, well, we did a little search to see if there were any 7-Elevens left in Idaho, and the only one is in Post Falls, which is about a seven-hour drive from the KTVB studios, thanks Google Maps. And maybe you're thinking, well, that's way too far for a Slurpee. But how does a bit more than four hours sound? Well, that's the closest 7-Eleven to Boise, which is in Walla Walla, Washington, and that's still a bit of a bike ride, kids. But the good news... They're still open 24 hours.
Okay, so for those familiar with music history, you might recognize one or two people in this film. That is Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead playing guitar in 1969 at Woodstock just off stage. And that woman right there who was singing with him, well, that's Idaho's Rosalie Sorrells, who at the time was just eight years into a recording career. And it's quite the journey for a woman born in Boise who became a mother of five kids before she decided to become a folk singer, who then found herself jamming in a field with Jerry Garcia at one of the most iconic music festivals in history. Was that the highlight of her career? Hardly. She still had 15 more albums left in her. The traveling lady, they called her. And after years on the road with those five kids, Rosalie Sorrells would make her way back home to the Idaho mountains repeatedly, where she lived out her later years in the cabin built by her dad in Grimes Creek. Well, that's where John Miller found her 25 years ago, a place where she stored a lifetime of memories woven into a tapestry of song and story. What sweet love have I come by on my last go round? I'm as much a storyteller as a, as a singer, really. Oh, I love this place. The place where she grew up and left and eventually returned. I'm delighted to live here. I don't enjoy writing. I, I have a really hard time doing it. I can't write a song on purpose just because I think I ought to. They come and bother me until I let them out. And you'll find a lot of songs have come and bothered her if you flip through her 21 albums. I started this when I was 33 years old. It was a hobby. I only did it because I didn't know how to do anything else. I was out by myself with no money and no skills and five kids to take care of. <laughs> it's not easy being a folk musician, but it's made easier knowing you're part of an extended family defined on Rosalie's ceiling by dozens of age-old stage bills. When my head blew up when I had the aneurysm in 88, uh, I had no health insurance, and all these people got together. Short on money, but never short on music, and always willing to help a friend. All of them got together and, and did benefits for me and, and try to help me pay my hospital bills. And the music, it is wild and sad like orphaned angels sing. At nearly 65, the music still comes from deep inside Rosalie Sorrells, filling this cabin that's already chock full of books and pictures and pieces given to her by the people that made this house her home. And as many places as traveling lady Rosalie Sorrells will visit, somehow it's just good to know. I will come back here. John Miller, Idaho's News Channel 7. Rosalie would live another 19 years, passing away at her daughter's home in Reno, Nevada at, in 2017 at the age of 83. But a lot of her stuff, which you saw in that story, the stage bills, the albums, the personal letters, remained at her Grimes Creek cabin until recently. Well, now you can see some of Rosalie's stuff, a collection covering 50 years of an artist's life, including her friendships and her advocacy at the Albertsons Library at Boise State University. She caught the very end of that folk revival movement of the late 50s in, in New York City. That's when she really started with the Newport Folk Festival in the early 60s where she was singing a lot of really traditional folk songs. And then it was the later 60s into the 70s and 80s where she started, you know, becoming the singer-songwriter that she was more well known for. I used to live in a big, fine house. Writing her own music, kind of two phases of her musical career. I am Stephen Hatcher, and I am the Folk and Traditional Arts Director at the Idaho Commission on the Arts. 
This is the Rosalie Sorrell's collection. This is a collection of personal items that Rosalie held on to herself for the entirety of her life that represents five decades of her musical career, her social issue advocacy, and, uh, and friendships. We have a lot of her concert posters from around the country, not only in Idaho, but uh, from, you know, everywhere from San Francisco to the East Coast. So it was nice to see the, you know, who she played with. Everyone from Malvina Reynolds to, you know, folks from The Grateful Dead, Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir. There's Muzzy Braun and Pinto Bennett. Uh, you know, she organized big Idaho-based concerts uh, with them birthday cards from, from friends like Ramblin' Jack Elliott and, and Robert Creeley, the poet, and, and Pete Seeger, the musician. Her personal letters from Hunter S. Thompson. I knew there was a sort of a connection there, but until you read the handwritten letters by Hunter S. Thompson, you don't know how well they knew each other. She brought Joan Baez to Boise, and she kept that ticket. All her social issues, her you know women's issues and and, and uh, conservation, political issues. Even though she spent a lot of time, you know, on the road touring and and being with friends, she always returned to Idaho, uh, and there was never any doubt that Idaho was her home and her first love. She's Idaho's matriarch of folk music. You can visit the Rosalie Sorrell's exhibit right now at the Albertsons Library on the Boise State campus through the end of August. The state of Idaho is known for its wilderness. We have the third largest area by acreage in the lower 48. 
There's another wild aspect of Idaho out there, the hundreds of wild horses scattered across the state. And you may be thinking, well, that doesn't seem like a lot. Well, that's because the Bureau of Land Management has removed nearly 4,000 of them since 1971 to maintain the health of the population. Okay, so what happens to them? Well, there's a program called Mustang Mania, where people take these wild animals and tame them. Sophia Bliss followed a Napa woman through the entire process, from a corral to competition. Saddling and mounting a horse looks pretty normal. But for these two, being able to do just that represents lots of hard work. In 2017, this Pinto mare was running with a wild herd on Bureau of Land Management land. BLM removes some of these animals, and this year about 100 wild horses and burros were in their corrals as part of the Mustang Mania program. In this program, approved trainers take these animals and have 118 days to make them as easy to handle as possible. So that's where this pinto mare was in the first week of March in the BLM corrals, not knowing she soon would be going home with Casey Wittick from Nampa. Casey and her kids decided to name this mare Sailor Moon. By day two, Sailor was still getting used to wearing a lead and to Casey. Sailor is an amazing Mustang, but she's also a hard Mustang. We were able to meet up with Casey and Sailor about a week into their progress. Horse training is a lot like teaching kindergartners your ABCs. And so like each day you start with A and then you like progress on A. What point A is, is getting forward movement. Like they actually relax when their feet are moving. Then they'll get used to that. And then I'll like to get some forward of contact. Usually they're not gonna let you walk right up to them. So you have to throw a rope and then get that contact. So have the rope on her and then you're holding the end of it. And then you got your first form of contact. Casey slowly gets Sailor used to her body weight to prep her for a saddle and eventually walking and trotting with a rider. Casey says the amount of training she does in a day all depends on the horse. If they're having a calm, quiet day, then she'll end on a high note. When learning anything new, progress is never a straight path forward. There are good days and there are some days that may make you nervous. She challenged me all the time, like she Bucked me off quite a bit. But Casey continued to guide Taylor. A little bit more than a month from the competition, finding their footing came a little bit easier. And loading into the trailer was looking like a breeze. About 25 days from the competition, Sailor was even comfortable around loud noises. She'll remind me, or whenever I get like, my head starts getting big and I'm like, I'm doing great. I'm amazing, I'm unbeatable. She's like, hang on, let's, let's humble you a little bit. Yeah, she changed me a lot. This change was not only one marked by Casey and Sailor's progress, but also by Sailor's appearance. And when I found out that she was a paint, I was like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be the coolest transformation ever. She's gonna go from this plain white horse to having like markings and freckles. And so she's a very flashy mare now. This transformation all leading up to a July Saturday night at the Ford Idaho Center in Nampa. Today's day two of the, of the Mustang Challenge. The Mustang Challenge includes several events, including handling and conditioning and trail riding. I was getting ready to do my trail pattern and I noticed, like I just took a big deep breath in and I'm like, oh my gosh, I did it. Like I took this wild horse that was like hot. Like she just wants to go as fast as she could. And I'm able to slow her down and she nailed it. Like nailed it. She got a 10 out of 10. And so like, that's perfect. A sign that all their hard work together was paying off. The last portion of this competition, a freestyle ride. Essentially, a choreographed dance between horse and trainer to show all the things they've learned and overcoming literal obstacles. So I took this wild, hot horse and I made her quiet. And it was like one of those moments where I was just like, I kind of, this is so cool. This is like a dream of mine and like she made it true. Casey and Sailor ended up placing second overall in the competition. Casey also says she couldn't have done this without Matt and Stacy Zimmerman. They host this challenge and help the competitors in training their animals. Casey says they are the true horse and people whisperers. So Brian, now that Sailor's work is done in this competition, the plan is to rehome her in Colorado. She's gonna go to a ranch. Oh, at really? The, mm -hmm, ranch at the base of Aspen, okay. which sounds pretty great. And she'll be going to, uh, she'll be reunited with 10 members of her herd, including including her mother. Wow, okay, so yeah. yeah, they've already pulled out a few of her uh, herd mm -hmm. outside of that. I was quite, you watch that and you go, well, why can't anybody just do that? Can you just show up to one of these roundups and say, I want that one? No, so you do have to be pre-approved okay. in order to participate in this program, and I would assume that's for safety. Okay, all right, thanks, Sophia. Mm -hmm.
All right, this Tuesday, well, let's wrap up this Tuesday, I should say. We talked a little bit about the abortion law, another abortion law in Idaho facing a legal challenge. This is the one about taking minors outside of the state to get a legal abortion in another state. This one from Janelle, the 508, but oh, we'll take it. We'll never understand why so many women think all the abortion laws are about babies. They are really about taking power away from women. We got a couple of these as well. Wouldn't it be illegal to take a minor across state lines without a parent or guardian's permission, regardless of the reason? I would consider that child trafficking, says Scott. Yeah, it would be illegal to take a kid even into another town without that parent's permission, right? So that's really not much of an argument, but this one's specifically dealing with maybe some kids, as we heard, that are in a difficult situation because of abuse. I used to ride a homemade banana seat bike with stretch handlebars to the 7-Eleven on Eustick near Mountain View. Cherry and Coke, my favorite flavors. Love the brain freeze. We'll see you tomorrow.